desperate to see the kingdom of God break into our lives. We cry out to you with all the Jesus, you are the beginning and end, creator, God, and king. Jesus did amazing miracles like no one else had ever done. There's never been a human being in the course of human history like Jesus Christ. And there is more information about this amazing person, Jesus, in the historical record than there is of any other human being who's ever lived. We, we have more, more has been written and said and taught about Jesus Christ than any other human being. And that is, of course, because he's not just a human being, he's God in human flesh. And it's Jesus that gives meaning to the course of human history. Uh, really, it could, really when, we, when we stand back and look at human history, it's the history of fallen mankind uh, that really has no sense, no meaning, no, no real purpose whatsoever. Jesus Christ comes into the world, God in human form, and He gives meaning to our human history. And now history is worth studying and worth understanding because of this person, Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, who comes in, He, he intersects into our story, and our lives become His story. Our, our human existence is its the intersection of Jesus Christ into the course of human history and he impregnates, if you will, our life with his story, his meaning. Jesus did miracles like no one else had ever done and yet the Bible says even though he did miracles such as no other human being had ever done, they still didn't believe him. The Bible says in John chapter 12 verse 37, but although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. Isn't that so sad? He did so many miracles and yet they're always asking for another sign. There's a sense in which once a person begins to demand proof after proof after proof, whether it's about the existence of God, that there is a God when creation itself gives us evidence that this couldn't have happened by accident. Any child knows that. Yet when a person hardens their heart to the knowledge of God, whether it's the existence of God or whether it's the identity of Jesus Christ as God, uh, then no amount of proof, no matter how convincing, is ever going to be enough. And that was the problem that, that people had in Jesus' day. He did amazing miracles such as no one had ever done, and yet still they refused to believe Him. John 15 verse 24, Jesus said, if I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and have also hated both me and my Father. So Jesus came and he did amazing miracles and, and he would finish doing miracles and they would say, do a sign to prove who you are. He said, I just did a sign. I, how many signs do you need? Look at the miracles, look at the testimony of my life. Jesus says in John 5, he said, the miracles that I've done, they testify about me as to who I am. If you want to really know who Jesus is, he says, even if you don't believe my words, believe my works, believe the miracles. Jesus had been casting out a demon and the people, they could clearly see that a miracle had been done and yet they blasphemed. It says in Luke chapter 11, verse 14, and he was casting out a demon and it was mute. So it was when the demon had gone out that the mute spoke and the multitudes marveled. You know, a, a sign is something that makes you wonder. That's why it's called a sign and a wonder. It's something that makes us marvel, something that makes us realize how marvelous God is. But some of them said, some of them said, and there's always a few in every crowd, some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. In other words, they said he's casting out uh, demons by the power of Satan. Others testing him sought from him a sign from heaven. Now here he is doing a miracle. He's casting out demons with the finger of God. And they say, do a sign. He says, I just did a sign. How many signs do you need? No amount of signs was ever going to be enough for these people because their hearts were hardened against Jesus Christ. And he goes on to tell them in verse 17, 
He, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Because the disciples of the Pharisees were also casting out demons. Because there is power and authority in the Word of God. Their problem wasn't that they didn't know the Word of God. They knew it. They taught it. Jesus said, whatever they say to you, do it because they sit in Moses' seat. Meaning, they sit in the authority, in the seat of authority of the teacher of the Word of God. So he said, obey what they say because they're teaching the Word of God. But don't do as they do because they're hypocrites. They say, but they do not do. They don't practice what they preach. But he said, your sons are casting out demons. So if you think I'm casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub, then who are your sons casting them out by? Therefore, they will be your judges. But, but, if I cast out demons with the finger of God, don't you love that saying of Jesus? If I cast out demons by the finger of God, Jesus is telling us who he is. Jesus could just point at a demon and say, go, and that demon would have to obey. He's casting at demons with the finger of God. Jesus, remember, he is the son of God. He said, I only do the things that please the Father. I always do the things that please him, and I only say the things I hear him saying. I only do the things that he wants me to do. Jesus comes doing not his own will, but the will of the Father, and he came not to condemn, but to set free. But here, people are judging Jesus and saying, he's casting out demons by the power of the devil. Why would they make that kind of accusation? Because they rejected his authority. They could not recognize him for who he was because of the hardness of their heart, so they blasphemed him. They said, he's trying to trick us. He's trying to prove to us that he has some power, but it's Satan's power in order to deceive us so that we will think that he is something special but they blasphemed. And Jesus, of course, cut through the, the illogic of their statement by saying, listen, these people are getting set free from Satan. If Satan is gonna set people free from his own power, his own kingdom, of course, will fail. So if I'm working for Satan, and if I'm casting out demons by the power of Satan, then I would be, if I'm working for Satan, I'd be defeating that kingdom. So obviously, I'm doing God's work, setting people free from the power of Satan, and that shows that the kingdom of God is among you. The kingdom of God has come. Jesus, by the finger of God, because he is God, could cast out devils and set people free. And that's what Jesus came to do. He said, I've come to destroy the works of the enemy. He says, if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are at peace. Who's the strong man? Satan. He's talking about a person who is under the power and authority of Satan's kingdom. Remember, Jesus said in John chapter 8, whoever sins is a slave of sin. You're powerless. I know people that they, they want to be Christians, they want to obey God, but they find themselves powerless to do so because they are under the power of Satan. They're enslaved to their own sinful desires. And when a person is enslaved to their own sinful desires, all the New Year's resolutions in the world will not set that person free. It is going to take the power of one greater than that strong man to bind the strong man and to take away his weapon and to loose that prisoner from the power of the strong man. That's what Jesus came to do by the finger of God. When a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he, that's Jesus Christ, thank you God, thank you Lord. When a stronger man than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. We are the spoils. Jesus comes to rescue us, to ransom us from the enslavement of sin, to set us free from the power of darkness. Remember Jesus said, whoever the sun sets free is free indeed. Jesus comes to displace the power of darkness that we might be filled with the kingdom of God, filled with the light and the life of the kingdom of God. He who is not with me is against me. 
and he who does not gather with me scatters. There's a sense in which when Jesus comes, you know, and God comes in every person's life, the revelation of Jesus Christ comes perhaps at a moment you're not expecting. And when you hear the light of the gospel, it's too late. You can't cover your ears and say, I don't want to hear it. It's too late. You're responsible for what you know. What will you do with Jesus Christ? How will you respond when the Son of God reveals himself to you? Jesus talked about when an evil spirit comes out of a person, it leaves that person and it goes through dry places. What are dry places? Dry places speaks of a place where that evil is seeking to occupy. There is, there is a real spiritual warfare going on all around us. The, there is the unseen world of spiritual conflict. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6 that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness, powers of darkness in heavenly places. The heavenly places are the unseen spiritual dimension that we live in. We are as human beings, we're body, soul, and spirit. A person, if they're not born again, they're just a body and soul. But when a person is born again, they become born of the spirit. They are a spiritual being. We are eternally alive the moment that we are born again. But a person who does not have the spirit of God residing in them, they're subject to the spiritual influences, the unseen evil that's all around us. And anybody who denies the existence of evil just needs to wake up and realize the world that we're living in. There is evil everywhere. You turn on the television, you look on the internet, you just walk down the sidewalk and look at the, the, the things around us. We're here in a beautiful environment, it's very peaceful, yet we live in a fallen world. And Jesus talked about the reality of evil spirits. He cast out evil spirits. Wherever Jesus came, he displaced spiritual darkness and there was the invasion of the kingdom of light. And yet Jesus says it's not enough to just have the evil cast out. He said it's not enough to have that evil spirit go out because that spirit is looking for some place to occupy. Now we don't understand all of these things completely, but there's a sense in which on the day of judgment, Satan and his angels will be cast into the lake of fire. It was not created for human beings, it was created for the devil and his angels. And yet when people align themselves with Satan and they choose to rebel against God like Satan and his angels did, then they're subject to the same judgment. Jesus didn't come to condemn people, he came to deliver people, he came to save, to seek and save that which is lost. And Jesus is our Savior. He comes not just to save us in name only, He comes to set us free from the penalty and the power of darkness. And so He wants to displace that evil, all the evil influence, all the evil spirits that influence us and try to bind us, try to empower us. He wants to deliver us from those. And when Jesus, with the finger of God, He says, go! And the spirits of Satan, those, those evil spirits, they leave a person, they're set free from that demonic influence. Suddenly, where they were powerless because they were enslaved to some evil desire, whether it's lust or greed or anger or whatever that spiritual enslavement is, it's gone, that person is free. Yet, it's not enough for your house to be swept clean and empty. You've got to replace that void with the kingdom of God. And Jesus warned, he said, when an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes through dry places. It can't find some place to inhabit. And it, when it can't find a place to inhabit, it'll go back to its former house, that former person. And if it finds it empty, swept clean, in order, but empty. He says, there's nobody here. Who should be there? Jesus Christ. We need to put on Christ and be filled with the Spirit of Christ. That means we must be proactive in our spiritual life, daily feeding upon Christ as our daily bread. If you're not doing that, then that evil influence, Jesus could cast out those demons every day for you, but if you're not replacing what was cast out with the kingdom of God, the devil, Jesus said, is gonna come back, he's gonna bring seven more spirits, more wicked than himself, Jesus said, and the end of that person is worse than the beginning. Because why? Because the person was not intentionally proactive in replacing what was cast out with the kingdom of God.